Today, as the topic of this panel discussion is social issues affecting mental health. That is really need of the hour topic. So uh, I would like to request, first of all, to do Professor Dr. Nizamuddin, sir, please come on the stage and say a few words. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much for inviting a non-psychologist to the podium. But I'm very close to psychologists. I'm a sociologist. We have a subject called social psychology we study in sociology. So it, in some connection, we are there. But today's topic is very interesting. But let me tell you where I come from on this issue. Some 30 years ago, when I was in, in New York, I used to argue that mental illness, mental sickness, is created by the Western scholars. It's not a real thing. That was my belief. It happened because I saw a movie those days. The title was One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest. It was a case study, which I... And then I used to see a lot of people being sent to the mental homes in New York City through police decisions, through other decisions, not necessarily analyzing thoroughly whether or not they have mental illness. Then I read a book, a report of WHO some 10 years ago, which documented that mental illness is growing in developing countries and therefore we should be helping developing countries to deal with mental illness. There is a WHO report. I immediately saw a, world, a, a scholar from the British University questioning the report, how far this report is genuine. Is it report based on pharmaceuticals who are supplying depression drugs? What are the real reliability of this report and what is the basis of calling that social illness or mental illness or depression is growing in the developing countries? Historically, mental illness, as you know, has been a problem for developed countries, uh, especially in the old age. They, because they are the first one to experience old age. We are only experiencing now. So there was known to be a, a disease of uh, old age and advanced countries. Two reasons. Because we thought, uh, people argued that developing countries, particularly Pakistan, Muslim countries have a social structure, a family structure, which really tries to help prevent serious mental illnesses because they really live together, they share their problems and they get some advice and support. This was the common belief because of culture and social structure, we are not that bad as compared to the developed countries. So our mental illness is not that great. Now, we are thinking, I'm confusing now with mental illness, mental well-being or mental health, of that matter, social health, family health, is all you can use synonymously. But now, with a lot of data coming from around the world, again, the WHO report has been launched called Determinants of Social of Mental Illness. There's a new book a report came out recently. And they're documenting what are the determining factors, both in developing countries and developed countries. They still argue, yes, Prevalence is very high in developed countries, but it's growing in developing countries. Therefore, we need to be very careful to see what can be done to prevent it before it becomes a epidemic or a pandemic. Now, the question is, how are we dealing with these issues in Pakistan today? There, this is a very serious structural uh, problem. It's not a slogan or or it cliches, it's a really serious problem. It deals with structural problems, economy, politics, education, health. What we do in, in, in the, toward the welfare of human beings is all related to the mental well-being and mental health. If there are a lot of inequities, as, as we do in Pakistan, a lot of inequalities, a lot of differences between gender, a lot of differences between class, unemployed and employed, Poverty, all these factors contribute towards a few, not mental illness, but mental disturbances. 
how do we address this issue? So one argument, one school of thought says, unless you address the structural problems of poverty, inequality, injustice, you cannot address the problems of mental health. It's a reflection of society's overall approach towards human beings. If you, dis if you distinguish between human beings, different classes, gender, then you are creating problems. And then on top of it, when you have unemployment rate, is highest among the people who are poor. The wage of, the way of living, the wages are so low. They, they suffer a lot of problems. So some people say that the amount of suffering Pakistani society does, there should be all mental, mental illness, but because of social support and family structure, that doesn't come out that seriously. But it is a very serious problem in terms of poverty, economic injustices, social injustices, ill health, lack of health coverage. All these contribute towards mental well-being and mental health. But unless you contribute towards these factors, you may end up having mental illness. We cannot say we have an epidemic of mental illness, but we have mental disturbances, mental problems. We have a lot of growing um, suicide rates. We have growing uh, people getting into depression drugs. We have growing Ill, uh, level of illnesses in Pakistan. Though may, they may not be reflected in many statistics because they are not reporting to an institution as other countries do. And we don't have those health systems or social worker system which can afford them to go and register them as mental sick people. We don't have that kind of arrangement. In advanced countries, they do. They won't let you live in the house. If they determine that you have mental problem, they'll send you right away to a mental institution. That created further a mental problem. But fortunately, in our country, we don't have that strict compliance of the protocol that you have developed in the Western world. Other thing I've been arg arguing with the psychiatrist and psychologist, that our tests, our instruments, our protocols, we are really basically primarily we are borrowing from different culture a different society. We are not developing yet. They have some efforts were made, but not a whole lot. So unless we change that whole measurement structure, I have used to interview people for lecturer's job in Gujarat University, and I saw some of the thesis. And thesis was growing uh, problems in the family structures because of the discrimination of relationship between family members, whether it's mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, or relationship between the two and the family. And therefore, that, that is affecting the mental illness of the primarily about the newlywed woman. The study was done on a battery of questions that were in, impl imported from other countries, not necessarily the reality on the ground of the, what's happening. So unless we start collecting our own data, I'm sure by now, it's to 15 years ago that I'm talking about, I'm sure things have improved now. We have more indigenous data, more indigenous research, which is documenting about problems. And, and that is why we are celebrating this today's Mental Health, Mental Wellbeing Day. So we can really understand the implications of this problem, the extent to which this is prevalent in our country in our society, and what can be done to mitigate circumstances. Because we don't have many mental hospitals compared to our population size. The population size of Pakistan is too large to have one or two mental hospitals, which is basically dealing with severe cases. And one point in question you have on the podium, the Fountain House uh, MS, who have been supporting, helping mental disturbance patients for long many years and they have been they will be, he'll be able to tell you what kind of people come to their institutions i just want to give one example i once funded a project of aging populations in india south africa and pakistan from the united nations when i was in new york i found some very disturbing statistics in india we found a case study that very well-to-do family. The son was settled in Canada. 
father dies, so he comes to India, living in a big house. So he, he convinces his mother that you cannot live here alone. I'll take you to a nice place where you can be taken care of. So he brings up to an ashram and he sells that big house, takes the money to Canada. That's a real case study in India. Then I found a case study in South Africa. The older people who were getting pensions, they had to go to the post office or the bank to get the money. So their young church and the family will take them into the bike or otherwise, take the money from the bank or the post office. And then these young church will take away their money and just keep them 20%. This is enough for your pocket money. They were basically exploited by the young people. The third uh, case was from Karachi, where older women were put into the Ediv, Ediv old homes with, with children living in the city, but they had dropped them there, like it happens in madrasas. And they are, the condition in which they were living was on the straws, on the ground, and very bad condition. But, but they come from a good family system, but somehow the children dropped them. To the, the old home. This is old age and middle age and young people. This is a societal problem. It affects all ages, therefore, we should study how structurally our society is being affected by the way of life, by the economy, by the economic development, by the poverty, by living conditions, all affecting our social life. I think there is a pressure, there is tension at all age groups. Today, there is a whole issue of lack of tolerance. Lack of tolerance. Everybody is intolerant. Young, old, oldest, everybody is intolerant. And they are not accepting any minute variation in life. They will not tolerate. This intolerance comes from pressure, tensions, pressures of all kinds. Unemployment, low income, low quality, low, low injustice. But all factors are contributing towards our mental illness or mental health problems, which need to be studied thoroughly. I'm sure all these departments are coming from psychology. They're doing these studies. I'm sure they come out with their presentation. But I feel that a thorough job has to be done for all age groups. And then study what are the factors. I'll do your indigenous research, not, not just import a protocol from outside and implement it in this research. Take the case of Fontenhouse. House. What kind of people are coming there? And they have Fontenhouse House have they have a new center in Saboda, I think. So they are slowly building up. So you should find out what kind of people are coming and who's dropping them in these places and how are they handling it. And there are many, many people um, who not have access to, to any other services. So they are li basically living in the house creating for suffering from tensions, from pressures, and letting other people suffer from tension. That's why nobody is helping them. Once I used to jokingly used to talk about in my industry regard that we have so many beauty parlors. I wish every beauty parlor next door would have a counseling center. So that they could people could easily go. Um, I saw this in Korea, Koreans wanted to learn language, English language. What they've done in, in the Korean marketplaces, see, it's happened, it's a language center. There's a small booth, you go inside, put the coins, and you just see the videos and learn the language. You spend half an hour, one hour, depending on how many coins you put. They learn English language that way, not in classrooms, not in the lecture, they learn through DVD, CD players. I think counseling is a luxury. I used to call in, in America, the most expensive session is from a psychiatrist, what we call shrinks. In Pakistan, we don't have counseling centers. People don't go to. Everything hush hush, let family talk care of it, don't talk about it. That is actually further aggravating the situation. So we, if you have good counseling centers in the universities, anonymously, and in the, in the cities, People can go there whenever they want to go. There should be a place where they can go visit, talk to people who are objective, 
who are not part of the family members, so can, they can freely talk about it. That is not there. So unless we start, we only have health centers, I know, the, the basic health centers, but they don't have as, as yet a psychiatrist there. I mean, in big hospitals, they may have some psychiatrists, but norm, normally we don't have counselors even. So I think we need to establish some institutional arrangement through, through social society, civil society, or government available to people to go there and talk about their personal problems. So this is a problem which you can resolve yourself. What a psychiatrist does in the US, he will just listen to you, or she will listen to you, and you will resolve your own problem through discussions. If not, they are not prescription given to them. Of course, there are some minor drugs, people can take it, just for coming. That's why we have so much depression drugs going on in Pakistan, because you, just, you can just go and buy it from the pharmacy without any, any prescription. People just take it, buy it. But that's uh, because they have no other access to proper scientific analysis of what's happening with them. So I think we need to create institutional arrangement in Pakistan, both in the health center, in the education sector, in the private sector where people can have access to professional advice, professional guidance to, in order to overcome these problems. I think my only recommendation to you that let's think about it as a society societal problem for all ages, not particularly limited to anyone, one group, all ages and all gender, male, female, both, and all age groups. Children have the problem, you have to find a way to, to, to somebody to examine them, talk to them, and importantly, the, the tolerance level has to be established. Sorry. Anyway, I just wanted to say these few words, and, and we can, I'm willing to talk to you and have some exchange of interaction from the audience, from your participants. I can see 100% gender female, maybe 99%. <laughs> so psychology seems to be a concern of women only, not, although women become very good counselors, very uh, useful for everybody, but how many men will go to them, I don't know, to seek counseling and guidance, so, but I think, uh, the amount of number of people who are training for counselors, they're mostly females. So how are we going to address the gender imbalance that we have, but that we need in the service sector down the line? So at least talk about it further, and I'm uh, open to discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nizamuddin, for your thought-provoking talk.